Hello, Nick Lafter here, and welcome to Management 409, Operations Management. What we're going to start talking about with this particular week is process management. Now, when it comes to the process, well, I've oftentimes said that everything is a process, and that isn't too far from the truth. After all, you take something and hopefully makes it, make it of greater value. That's what businesses do. That's how businesses make money. So if, this, if these processes are how businesses make money, then what do we need to do in order to make sure that the processes run smoothly, that the processes run well? Now, in order to get this done, there are certain things that need to be looked at, certain things that need to be addressed. So we need to look at the rules by which processes operate, by which processes run. And that is largely the purpose of this chapter, to learn those rules by which processes run. So, to that end, what we're going to look at are several things within the area of process management. We're going to look at process mapping. In other words, how do we represent a process? How do we visualize a process? Then we're going to look at what goes on in a process. We're going to look at how to measure a process's performance. And we're going to look at this quality known as Little's Law. And Little's Law is a law. It is a physical law that is the relationship between how many items we can work on at one time, how long it takes for an item to go through a step in a process, and throughput rate. And throughput rate is churn. It is how the rate at which items are completed through a process. It is a measure of capacity for a step in a process and ultimately for the process as a whole. So, why we are here? We are here because everything that occurs in business is a process of some type. We take stuff and make it into more valuable stuff. Now, next week we'll start talking about projects, and projects are just really big processes. There are processes that you do once or twice that are just extremely complicated. So if everything that is done in business is a process, taking something, you know, taking raw materials, taking inputs, and converting it into something more valuable, we need to see the laws of physics by which these processes run. So, a process is any part of an organization that takes inputs of some type. That input could be a physical good, it could be something intangible, it could be a service. And it transforms it into some form of output that is hopefully more valuable than what we put in. Some examples here, taking bread and meat and veggies and whatever else you would put on that sandwich and making a hamburger. Uh, taking customers, luggage, pilots, attendants, and an airplane and making a flight. Now, a flight is not a good. A flight is a service. However, it is something, it is a product offering. It is something that can and is sold by a particular company. Another example, taking hair, clippers, water, and hair care products and making a haircut, making a hairstyle. And uh, again, another service. Usually when you get your hair stud or your hair cut or hair styled, usually you end up with less than what you had before. But in general, because of the shape of that haircut, you're happier with it than you were. And then, of course, another example, taking information on a company's cash and assets and inventory and making a financial statement. Now, it's rather hard to sell a financial statement, but consider the value of that financial statement to a particular company, or more important, to the investors of that company. So, again, a process is any part of an organization that takes some form of input and transforms it into something more valuable. Now, this does bring up a, another point that was just made, and that is that 
The result of a process does not necessarily result in a physical good. It doesn't even necessarily result in a saleable product. So what value is it to say, look good, there's some physical value to it. There's some monetary value to it. There, people spend billions of dollars each year to look better. Uh, another example. What value is it to fly cross-country? There's a value in location sometimes. Uh, sometimes there's value in knowing what a company is really worth. Now, some of these things are difficult to sell. However, there is value to them. And we need to respect that value. We need to understand that value. And as a result, when it comes to a process, we need to understand sometimes what that value is. What, is, what value is created? by the process. So, what do we seek? What do we want? Ultimately, we want to have a process that flows well. We want a process that is efficient, that has people working while they're there, and we want to reduce bottlenecks. We don't want look, we don't want items piling up excessively at certain steps of the process. Now, it's impossible to eliminate bottlenecks altogether. However, we do want to reduce them. We do want to mitigate them. And at the same time, we want to improve the utilization of our process. We want employees, while they're there, to be working. We want them productive. We want them generating value. As a result, we don't want employees sitting around so much, even if other parts of the process are swamped. Now, I do need to make a caveat on this. And it's a lesson that will become a little more clear later on. And that is that ultimately you need to generate value with what you do. Now I need to be very careful with this. And the reason why is because what value is it to make a product that never get sold, that won't ever get sold. As a result, and what we're finding with processes is an increase in this idea that demand should generate, should, should dictate how much we get done with a process, because ultimately we can be blocked by demand when it comes to our process. And I'll talk about blocking and starving in just a minute. Well, with any good problem solving, the first thing we do is we state what we want. The next thing we have to do is we have to look at the current situation. We have to see where we are at that moment. So, oftentimes with a business, there's bottlenecks, there's problems, there's inefficiency. And so, you may have steps in the process that are absolutely swamped with work. And you may have other steps in the process that are just sitting idle with nothing happening. And also, hopefully, and if we don't have this, we'd better generate it. Hopefully we have a description of the process. Hopefully we have some idea as to what gets done over the course of this process. So hopefully we have a description of the process as well as the amount of time that each step in the process takes. How much time does it take to get something done in a particular step of a process? Ultimately, when it comes to processes, there's five things I want you to remember. Now these five things, after it's all said and done, at some point this class will be over and you will hopefully go on with your lives and hopefully go on with your careers. If you remember nothing else, I want you to remember some things from here. First, Little's Law. Little's Law is just this mathematical relationship between the amount of time that it takes to get a particular item done, the number of items you can work on at one time, and throughput rate. Throughput rate is churn. It is how much you can get done at one time. How, how fast you can get items out. Now, throughput rate is also a measure of capacity. It is a measure of how much a particular step in a process can get done 
and as we'll see later, how much a process can get done. The second rule is that you're only as fast as your slowest step. So what does that mean? A good way of thinking about it. Suppose you're on a nature hike and all of you are on this hike. How fast are you going to go? Are you going to go as fast as, say, the fastest person in the group? You know, the healthiest person in the group? Are you going to go at an average? Well, no. What's going to happen is you're only going to be able to go as fast as the slowest person in that group. Well, as it happens, processes are the same way. For all of the steps in a process, you will only be able to go as fast as the slowest step in that process. In other words, the step in the process that has the smallest throughput rate is what is ultimately going to limit how much that process can get done. The third rule I want you to remember, and this is one that has applications beyond this chapter, beyond this course, and that is that you have to be sure you're comparing apples to apples, that you're comparing the same things. This is one of those lessons that, it was one of the first lessons that I had to learn when I was an engineering student a long time ago, but it's one of those lessons that is hard to grasp at first in many ways because of how we have experienced mathematics over the course of the years. Usually with mathematics we know it as just numbers. Well, numbers are almost never just numbers. There's usually some dimensional component to them. Dollars. Dollars is a dimensional component. When, you, when you're driving down the street miles per hour, that's a rate. You know, well, you know, similar to a throughput rate. So there's always going to, well, not always, but there's usually going to be a dimensional component to the numbers that you work with. And when you're comparing steps in a process, you have to be sure that you're comparing the same things. And this can get tricky, as we'll see later. This can have some issues. So how do we make sure that we're comparing apples to apples with regard to this particular process? Now the last two rules are a little more esoteric. The first three you will most certainly deal with mathematically, but the last two, well, with the next one, the math is a little tricky. I don't ask my undergrads to learn that particular mathematics. I do ask my grad students to learn it, but I don't ask my undergrads. And that is that uncertainty reduces the performance of a process. And we'll talk about why oh, near the end of the chapter, but basically... The reason why uncertainty reduces performance in a process is because you can't get time back. Once time is gone, it's gone and it's forever lost. And what we find is that because of this, there are these moments when a process may be blocked or starved that we just can't get back. We can't get back that capacity. And because we are as stated, only as fast as our slowest step. There are moments when one particular step in the process may be the slowest. There's moments when another step in the process may be the slowest. But because you go to that slowest step, whenever you have this uncertainty, instead of going to the average, you end up going to a little bit below the average. And then there's this last rule. You play to win the game. And hopefully everyone is hearing Herman Edwards' voice saying this, because this is one of those things that needs to be understood. Whatever you do, it needs to be with the product in mind. It needs to be with satisfying the customer and having that in mind. If you make a product, if you just be busy just to be busy, that's not going to help you. That's not going to generate value. Ultimately, what you do must generate value. So if it is a product, it must be sold. 
Before we get that far, though, we need to put this information about our process into something we can understand. We need to put it into a language that we can use. So to that end, we need to take the information that we have about a process and we need to put it into something that we can better use, better calculate, better manipulate. And to that end, we're going to learn a little bit about process mapping and then, of course, we're going to learn about calculating the throughput rate for each step of the process. So, to that end, here's some directions. Here is a process. In fact, it is a process for that part of the process for building a computer. So we start by attaching the motherboard to the computer case. Once that's done, we insert and lock the CPU into the socket of the motherboard. You know, we set the jumpers of the motherboard so that they match the specifications. Then we plug in and clamp the cooling fan to the CPU and yada yada yada. That said, how useful is this? How well could we improve this process based on what we have here? Truth is, a description like this, it really doesn't help us all that much. What we need is a visual representation of what is going on with the process. And we also need some numbers. We need some ideas to what is happening with this process. So, what can we do? We can convert information like this into a visual map. And that is what we do with processes. We convert it into a process map. So we transform it. We translate that description, that verbiage of the process into something that we can easily understand, easily manipulate, easily calculate with. After all, hopefully the goal is to see what is happening with the process so that we can ultimately make decisions to improve it. So we represent the process as a process map. Now it's important to note that process maps can be as simple or as complicated as you could possibly imagine. Later on in the course when we get to what I call the grab bag we'll look at a far more complicated method of representing a process. That said, for our purposes, we can focus on just the simple, basic parts of a process map. So we have first rectangles, which we use to represent tasks, operations. This is getting stuff done. Then we have storage areas. We have lines, queues. We have inventory locations. And we usually represent these with triangles of some type. And then, well, we have decision points. Do you want fries with that? Um, do you want your car to be blue or red? All of these decisions will have some change to the process, and that change to the process needs to be represented somehow. And then, finally, there's the flow of materials or customers. You know, how do people, how do product, how does product flow through our process? We need some way of representing that and usually what we do is we represent that with an arrow. So, ultimately the goal of process mapping is to represent the process visually, to translate it into a format that we can easily look at and see, okay, this is how the product, how the customer flows through the process. So we can see how people and product flow and ultimately how these different parts of the process fit together. Because ultimately what we want to do is we want to make improvements to the process and hopefully make our process better. Ultimately, what we wish to do with this process is we wish to see where the product is being held up, where the customer perhaps is being held up. And there's three different ways that 
an item and an item could be a product that we're making could be a customer through a process there's three ways that an item can be delayed as it goes through the process the first is what we call starving second blocking and the third buffering and those three items those three ways in which a flow unit as it's called sometimes is delayed as it goes through the process that we will be look, talking about in the next video.